And on Nepal in the mountains, people don't necessarily think about scientific people up here, but he's really, really smart. And such young age as well, you know, he's like 10 years younger than me. Um, and came know, up it's with been such a, a discovery that we made just the other night, just the other morning, just chatting over breakfast. We haven't really even had a time to consolidate the theory. But what we're pretty sure is there's a fantastic paper that's coming out of this, definitely. And, um, and if it was not peer reviewed by Western science, yeah, you know, we'll peer review it in our Eastern science Eastern stuff. theory. And, and so I was just commenting on some posts and it was Arif Ali who, who saw I was into ether theory. And yeah, he he connected with me. He wanted to, to, to meet up online and I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we had this beautiful interview about a year ago where we were in Mexico and tried to explain to him, you know, what we have. And he was really into it. There was a lot of overlapping points. And so now we're here, finally, in Nepal. Hi, my name's Colin Power, and I'm from London, England, UK. And yeah, I suppose I am a, a kind of metaphysician, you could call me. Uh, I've enjoyed studying Vedic knowledge immensely, and it's broadened my horizons. Um, as well as that, I like to study mathematics and its application in science and technology, particularly the bridge that we're m moving at the moment, which is AI consciousness. And I find that a very interesting um, area of exploration. Um, as for myself, I sort of purport, you know, new models of the atom and various things like that from my website intoinfinity.com. You can find out much, much more. Um, and some of those theories we are publishing as papers as well, so that we can start to consolidate this knowledge in both an academic format. But most importantly, we are bringing a geometric blueprint to the earth, which is very simple for people to build at home with just simple compass constructions and card and scissors, you too could model the atom. And that's really where our strength in our theory lies, not only in its capacity to teach computers, but also to teach you. Okay, so it's amazing what you can learn over breakfast when you get two great minds working together over a simple conversation about Kailash. And that's how that began, you know. We started to talk about the Axis Mundi of the world and why that mythology might have existed. In You know, that ties in a lot to, like, Lord Shiva and the, the Shiva Lingam and the, uh, you know, the bundle on the top of his head where, you know, you get this water or semen or whatever you want to call it, you know, spurting out, which was significant because it was the beginning of, say, civilization. And in many respects, that's what you see, isn't it, with Kailash. It's, it has a north, south, east, west kind of facing pyramid almost, like but out of an immense sort of scale. And to say almost like the lingam of the earth, you know, it, it could be, you know, well considered, uh, particularly with the culture and everything like that. And, and therefore we were talking when we talked about the you know, grand theory of everything, actually the lingam is actually representative of this Taurus field, if you like, this inner core, which um, is, you know, how energy moves, if you like, through this, this surface of this water. And so, we, you know, we're talking more and more and then uh, we start to actually think about more about, oh, yeah, what, what happens when you start to link the 360 degree circle, which emerges from the Vedic knowledge and in India and all of that was very clear. And what I saw from my study of the Indus Valley all the way back then was that, you know, that culture had, that 360 degree circle had sort of like moved, I think, across into the Egyptians, you know, and we, they were using it then. And the reason I think that is because in our model, when you set Kailash at, z at this kind of zero, zero on the, on the equator of the east-west sort of uh, of the earth, it's actually about 31 degrees and up from the equator. And so that, that also gives us the sense that that's pi, you see, 1.3.1. 1. 
four two, etc. Three and a bit. So you could say, yeah, maybe it slipped slightly, but that's that's a very interesting resonance, isn't it, on the Earth itself? And so you know, we started to sort of think, hey, you know, what happens if you set that at zero? How does that adjust our perceptions of where these sacred sites are set? So what sort of happened then was I started to do the calculations. Well, you know, because you can roll across the equator, you know, and then you get the, lo the longitudinal lines coming down, and so everything's on the longitudinal lines, and then you just measure it out, you know. And all sorts of interesting ratios were emerging, pi between the golden, you know, the, the, the pyramids and everything like this. And, and then it's, it was quite well known, I think, that Stonehenge and the pyramids kind of lay along a vertical on the Earth. A lot of people know that, particularly as I've been hanging out in Glastonbury and all the megalithic builders are talking about pyramids and all this stuff. But I also had read a book about that, about the 366 degree circle, and I knew about the 366 being the side real year, you know, because when you stand at the galactic center, it's not like 365 days, it's 366. You know, extra day gets added as we go around. And then we have the moon year, which is 364, you know, which is the... 28 days times 13 months of the year and that was another type of calendar and you find all that knowledge you know quite extensively in the mayans and and we were there like last year literally at chichen itza so i sort of pumped that into our you know our particular system as it were and what came out that was you know this really interesting geometric ratios that emerge and those ratios themselves show that there is a certain point where Kailash, in a way, is directed actually at the galactic center at exactly a 60 degree angle. And that is quite incredible, you know, that it just happens to be not, not close, but exact. And so the fact that this monumental mountain with such legendary kind of kudos in, in throughout Asia, you know, just happens to be a kind of needle point of a compass, if you like, which points us to the galactic center directly and would, in a sense, allow us at least to provide a calendrical system which could calculate the, what they call the long year count in the Mayan culture. And so long year count in Mayan culture stems, you know, 25,000, over 25,000 years, you know. And you can imagine what Kailash is doing is, is, is qualifying five of those in exactly the same way as the Mayan count is doing. So, so that's the model. The model is we are moving the Greenwich Mean Time around to, on, the, on the equator to now set it as um, Kailash Mean Time. And in doing that, what happens is we align in such a way that the geometry, the 60 degree geometry happens to align with the galactic center. And what we're saying is it's almost like you have the north, east, south, west of Kailash and it's, and it's you know, Lingam and all of its properties that where is the beginning of civilization. And then you scroll over, if you like, round to the May Mayan civilization where and you get a similar sort of amazing calendrical system and all of that. And then up to Stonehenge, where we get the 366 from the megalithic builders and all of that, our degree circle. And it, and all of the degree circles, if you like, like the Mayans have the, the 20, uh, 260 degree circle because that's how they qualified the moon, if you like, in 13s. But when you actually start to put this together, it, it forms one system which works as a whole. Now, that's pretty amazing anyway. But what we discovered was, is that when you start to look at this system through a certain lens, what we call our, we, we call it like our kind of sp special ratio that we use, a universal ratio, and that's to do with the golden ratio and something called the square root of six divided by two. And those are really important ratios in our system. Anyway, um, when we put it into that model, should we say, what, what starts to happen is it, we started to get relativistic results on something called Lorentz gamma, and that sounds completely crazy, you know, because, you know, we've gone from qualifying stuff that's on the Earth and, like, mythological concepts and things like that into now a very interesting uh, metaphysical system almost 
but at the same time has real relevance to Lorentz Gamma and all of this other stuff in relationship to our distance from the galactic centre and all of this stuff. And it's quite profound. And, um, you know, it's been such a, a discovery that we made just the other night, just the other morning, just chatting over breakfast. We haven't really even had a time to consolidate the theory. But what we're pretty sure is there's a fantastic paper that's coming out of this, definitely. And um, and if it was not peer reviewed by Western science, you know, we'll peer review it in our Eastern science stuff. And I'll open it up to anyone who wants to sort of read it, you know, and let's do that. Let's publish that. So that then you guys can peer review us and let us, you, know, you can think what we think. We might make mistakes. We want to be corrected, you know. We don't feel like, you know, we need bias. We need progress. And that's it. So, um, yeah, so we're going to work. We're going to share that paper. And I think that's one of the really cool things that's come out of this meeting. Um, you know, and to say it, I think we're, we're both great minds. We've both got great ideas. I mean, his, mathemat his mathematics and science is fantastic, you know. I do dimensionalist science. I don't get involved with science. But, you know, he's in there, you know. <laughs> and um, and that's fantastic to meet somebody who's, like, so, like, science, you know. Whereas I'm, I'm more like math, you know, like, kind of this sort of bizarre computer math, if you like. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but, you know, but it sort of works, and that's what we like. You know, we, we work together really well. And, and I'm sure this won't be the last time that we, uh, we do something together. It'd be awesome. Hi, my name is Dr. Heike Bielek. Some people call me Dr. B. That's my stage name. And uh, just like Colin Power, I'm a little bit of an out-of-the-box scientist. I mean, my career began with studying biotechnology, so there's a lot of engineering part in that, a lot of mathematics. And then I went through um, the PhD program, which was actually pharmacology and toxicology. And then, yeah, it was like, it was like biology, the title. But in that time, I was already questioning, you know, the scientific um, framework. How do we look at data and everything like that? I wasn't really so satisfied because I feel like as a uh, scientist, you really dive very deeply into a subject, but you lose a little bit the overarching view. And also, I just didn't like how, you know, the healthcare industry was working because I was working in a pharmaceutical company. So... I made like kind of like a spiritual awakening, just asking questions and just not following the crowd, you know? And I felt like, okay, I'm just going to leave all of this behind and just see what the world's going to offer me because inside of me, I'm actually also an artist. I'm very creative. I'm a dancer, um, now also a musician. I've done a lot of uh, artwork. I do poetry. I mean, I have this creative thing inside of me and I went through the logic. And so when I went through the spiritual pathway, it brought me to India and I had some realizations about how I perceive the reality, you know, like really being inside of myself and, and letting go of my mind. Because a lot of people who are in the scientific world, they're really in their mind without actually stopping, just seeing, breathing. And that's when I really felt like, wow, there is something there that is beyond the things that we can describe by science. There's consciousness. I am conscious. I am beyond this body. And I understood that so deeply. And then I was just telling the universe, okay, I don't know what I want to do exactly, but I do want to follow the spiritual pathway. I want to be creative. I'm an artist. I need to live out that creativity. And also I studied 10 years science. So that, that must have been for something, right? So the universe just works in this miraculous ways where the manifestation happens. And it brought into my life, Mr. Colin Power and in this hippie community. And in that moment, I was probably one of the only ones I was just listening to him. And I felt like, wow, there's a lot of depth. And I felt this calling, there's something here that is quite revolutionary. It was just connecting all my brain codes together. Science and spirituality is actually one thing. And it can be expressed through art, through geometry. So I got all of these tattoos <laughs> as a kind of like um, reminder and also visual help sometimes when I'm just on the go to explain to people what I do and um, yeah, how the code works. This is, has also been termed sacred geometry, but it's way more than kind of a spiritual movement. You know, it's actually quite technological. There's a lot of logic in there, a lot of mathematics. And so um, 
you know, when we started to develop this theory over the last 10 years, uh, there was a lot of like, wow, this is a new thing. This is a new concept. And so I've been following a lot of the scientific communities on social media. And I was trying to find maybe people that are also on the same tip, like some of the discoveries we made, like, for example, the 4D ether theory. And so I was just commenting on some posts and it was Arif Ali who, who saw I was into ether theory. And yeah, he, he connected with me. He wanted to, to, to meet up online. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we had this beautiful interview about a year ago where we were in Mexico and tried to explain to him, you know, what we have. And he was really into it. There was a lot of overlapping points. And so now we're here finally in Nepal and we get to meet him. And yeah, I'm just so surprised how many beautiful and brilliant minds there are in the most, yeah, desolate places, you could say, you know, Nepal in the mountains, people don't necessarily think about scientific people up here, but he's really, really smart and such young age as well. You know, he's like 10 years younger than me and came up with this kind of new theory that basically speaks about the same things. Um, he's been thinking outside of the box and that's where we really resonate and the last few days have been so extraordinary because it wasn't just talking, it was actually finding the knowledge and all the facts that support that statement and coming up with a new paper, you know, within like two days. So, um, yeah, I guess expect the unexpected from us. Uh, there's some beautiful ma manifestations coming out of this and, um, also technology. So it's not just theory. We actually have proven models that will show you how amazing actually this blueprint is and just come up with something that is more in alignment, you know, that also helps yourself bring you back to your center, to your power, to your spiritual connection and understanding that there is hope for humanity. We can create a beautiful world. We have it in our hands. And so if you're listening to this, you're already one of us. And I'm so glad. I see you soon.